Uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, this video is an introduction uh, to the letter, uh, so I'll just read uh, the first uh, nine verses of chapter 1. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. That in every day, in every way, you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, when we read uh, any letter in the New Testament, uh, really what we have in the, uh, the, the Bible is enough for us to interpret the Bible. Nevertheless, it can be helpful just to think about some of the kind of history and geography of the places that uh, you know, Paul or John or Peter are writing to. And I think that's especially true uh, thinking about uh, first century Corinth. Again, we don't need this information. It just helps us as uh, we read uh, the letter. And uh, first century Corinth um, is um, a, a city that was uh, renowned for being a cosmopolitan and um, very religious, lots of different, lots of temples. Uh, it is located, uh, or modern day Corinth is a little bit, um, it's about six kilometers away from where Corinth in the first century uh, was. Uh, and it's located, it was located in the narrow strip uh, that separates the Greek mainland from what's called the uh, Peloponne uh, Peloponnese uh, region. And actually, um, that narrow strip uh, had a kind of paved walkway, and you could pay for a boat to be pulled across that paved walkway is about five or six kilometers long, which meant that you didn't have to sail all the way around uh, the, the long way around and it would uh, save you time and money. So it was a, a kind of center of trade. Uh, it was where the Isthmian Games were held, um, which um, were sort of second to the Olympic Games. Uh, so it was a cosmopolitan city. It had actually uh, revolted against Roman rule in 146 BC and then was rebuilt by Julius Caesar in 44 BC. So in some ways it was a new uh, city. And so it had some of the traits that you get with a, a kind of new culture where it's, it, it's aspirational and uh, where people are trying to define themselves. And you get sort of elements of that uh, in, uh, in the letter, um, a little bit of kind of status anxiety, uh, perhaps. And uh, you combine that with the kind of religious nature of like the, you know, the first century Greco-Roman world. And uh, there's this kind of mixture of anxiety that kind of translates into, um, you know, wanting to, to please the gods as well. That's some of the background. Uh, the letter itself, if you've read 1 Corinthians, you'll know that uh, Paul has uh, quite a problematic relationship with uh, the Corinthians. Uh, some of the things that he has to deal with in this letter are uh, pretty um, striking, um, really, in terms of the, the sinfulness. Uh, chapter 5, uh, he has to um, tell them that they need to discipline uh, someone in their congregation who was sleeping with uh, his stepmother. But even before that, uh, chapter one and two, we've got disunity and division into chapter three uh, within the church. Um, chapter five, as we said, there's sexual immorality. Chapter six, there are lawsuits uh, amongst them. Chapter seven, uh, if, if some of them are being immoral, some of them seem to be going the other way and uh, almost... Um, uh, having this kind of ascetic view of, of marriage, this kind of confusing uh, understanding of marriage. And then at chapters 8 to 10, they have a very warped view of how they should relate to uh, kind of pagan idolatry in the town. And really, in, in one sense, that was uh, understandable because if you wanted to do business deals, you needed to kind of meet with people in restaurants in that were held in the temple uh, uh, court. So Paul kind of really helps them uh, to think through what's appropriate, what's not appropriate in that context. And then uh, it's not just kind of the pagan worship of the outside world. There's their own kind of corporate worship. 
uh, which he deals with in 11 to 14. And there's confusion about uh, the Lord's Supper, confusion about spiritual gifts uh, with different people privileging certain gifts over, over another, which seems to be the sort of worship equivalent of some of the disunity and looking down on one another that was in uh, chapters um, uh, 1 and 2. And then chapter 15, in some ways, the climax of the letter where he uh, reminds them of the resurrection. And it seems that some of them, for whatever reason, had uh, you know, I believe that there wasn't going to be a bodily resurrection or that it had somehow taken place. They, they believed in Jesus' resurrection, but not their own resurrection. Uh, so there's all these kind of disparate um, issues that Paul is dealing with. But a few things, a few threads that we can, uh, we can hold together. First is, you know, Paul's evident love for the church. Um, it seems that he wrote to the Corinthians uh, multiple times. Uh, so this is actually his second correspondence chapter 5 talks about a letter that he had uh, written to them so the Corinthians for all their problems have a special place in uh, in Paul's heart and uh, obviously he writes another letter uh, to Corinthians and actually it seems that possibly he wrote a, a letter in uh, in between so this is a church he's not giving up on despite their immorality and and you see this in 2 Corinthians their kind of coolness towards uh, him as an apostle uh, he really wants uh, them on side with his kind of apostolic uh, gospel. But there are all these kind of disparate issues that uh, seem to be uh, going through 1 Corinthians. Is there a sort of central problem? Some people say it's to do with their um, disunity. That's the central problem, but that doesn't seem to deal with everything. Some people say they've got a wrong view of the future of uh, what, what called eschatology. Um, you know, is it that they think that they've arrived, that, that all the kind of future blessings, they have them um, already. And there's a lot that, that explains a lot in, in the letter. And I certainly think that's there. But um, the kind of consensus in the commentaries, if you look at, you know, uh, that the, the, the common problem, which in one sense is quite simple, but it's quite profound, it's worldliness, um, that uh, the Corinthians are essentially worldly. And uh, what you get in uh what you don't get in Corinthians that you get in uh, other letters like to the Thessalonians is this sense of tension between the Corinthian church and the world. So when Paul writes to the Thessalonians, it's like, I know the world is persecuting. You just hold on, keep trusting in the Lord Jesus. You don't get that in, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians. It's almost like uh, I've got to pull you back from your, uh, you know, your worldliness. Uh, there's no kind of conflict between the Corinthians and the world because they, they are so worldly. And how does he correct that? Well, throughout the letter, he corrects it by applying the gospel to their situation. And there is a move in, uh, in the letter from a focus on the cross at the beginning. Uh, that's really how he corrects their kind of uh, their, their sense of, um, you know, who is impressive or not and their sense of disunity. He corrects that with the cross, continues to apply the cross, but he also talks about the resurrection and uh, it's not quite as simple as saying, you know, he starts with the cross in chapter one and then chapter 15, the big resurrection chapter, because there are references to the resurrection before that. But that is the sort of general move in, uh, in the letter that he corrects their worldliness by applying the gospel of the cross and resurrection. And so it's a wonderful uh, letter. It's a very, very timely contemporary letter because our society is very like the Corinthian society and uh, our churches our temptation is to be worldly and uh, to try and be liked uh, by the world. And the solution that we need is the solution that Paul gave uh, the Corinthian church, which is the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, crucified and uh, raised again. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for the way that Paul corrects the worldliness of the Corinthians. Please help us as we read this letter to heed that correction ourselves, uh, that we uh, would... Um, uh, know the cross and the resurrection, and that would define us, and not, uh, well, we would not allow the world to define us, and we ask it in Jesus' name.